you guys know that the YouTuber Vorsch is apparently just like a, a massive fucking neoliberal? You gotta watch the clip to understand what I mean. And I think like anyone who has, is like any, even remotely on the left, like even a social democrat or something, will be able to watch this clip and understand immediately what I mean by neoliberal because this is like literal like just verbatim meaningless neoliberal buzzword salad like talking about like economic freedom resulting in prosperity and shit and how like neoliberal um free trade agreements like nafta are good it wouldn't be interesting or even worth mentioning if it wasn't coming from someone who is professed to be like a, a anarchist socialist on the left or something who considers themselves like an arbiter of what is left and with a community that also believes that about themselves. Like, straight up saying shit like this is absolutely absurd. So here's the clip. It was uploaded, by the way, by, like, a guy who, or someone, who, like, edits Vosch's clips for them for free. So that's an additional pathetic layer Actually, here. Just watch this. It's, it, every single thing that he says here is neoliberal ideology in its purest, most obvious form. And I'll, ex I'll, I'll of course, going, going to go into way too much depth after we watch this to explain that, so don't worry. I'm, I'm capable of backing that up. But I feel like if you consider yourself a leftist or a socialist or something, you probably already should understand why this is exactly what I just said it is. But apparently Vosh doesn't. Like, I, I don't know, I feel like someone who's been like a supposedly leftist streamer for like three years knows that what they're saying here is just neoliberal ideology par excellence. You know, I, I can't give him the benefit of the doubt here and say that he's just being dumb because he know he has to know what he's saying, right? What do you think about Ukraine joining the EU? I think it's a great thing. Um, the European Union has its bureaucratic issues, but for the most part, it seems to legitimately increase the economic freedom of people in those countries, and it makes them more prosperous. So, you know, fine. Um, I, I'm, I'm generally a pretty big fan of regional trade blocks, you know? It's really just a way of how they're handled. Like, NAFTA had its problems, but the concept of, like, facilitating strong economic mobility within a region is good. You know what I mean? Like, that's actually a good thing, you know? I would I would love to live in a North America where Mexico, Canada, and America are all just like regional buddies. People can travel to and from to work, no big deal, no big border crossing issues, whatever. Like the EU has. The EU has been, I think, a generally good thing. I understand there are problems. I understand that there are some bureaucratic regulations that people don't like, and they don't like having an extra governmental agency above the nation state that, you know, I get that. Um, but for the most part, I think it's a good thing, and I think it'll be good for the people of Ukraine. Everything that he said there is not just wrong, but the most base sort of like neoliberal NPC talking points imaginable. Like economic freedom resulting in economic prosperity. Like, do I need to explain that economic freedom is just a euphemism used by neoliberals to mean the freedom for businesses to do whatever the fuck they want? Which obviously, if you're on the left, is a bad thing for you, right? Like economic freedom in the sense that he's using it here, in the sense that feels like he supports the trade Holocaust. blocks as vehicles, and they're not really blocks because they're not actually beneficial for everyone inside them. Like the EU and NAFTA, you know, when when they talk about economic freedom, what they mean is essentially any sort of barrier to capital, to capital being able to do what it wants. So it's economic freedom for the bourgeoisie, basically. So it means like you know stuff like um. Having like trade unions, strong trade unions, for example, actually lowers economic freedom, according to the way that they use this term. And this is, they're the only ones who use this term at all, by the way. So it's obvious that's the way that he's using it. Things like trade unions, you know, workers' rights, any sort of barrier to the free export and import of capital, any sort of regulation. These are all things that are considered to lower economic freedom. And that's why, like, like it, it's a literally a fucking measure that was essentially coined and created by neoliberal think tank. Like, for example, the Fraser Institute runs the Economic Freedom of the World Index, and the Fraser Institute is a right-wing Canadian neoliberal think tank. The Index of Economic Freedom is produced by the Heritage Foundation. I hope I don't need to explain who the Heritage Foundation are. They are like the guys who gave fucking Ronald Reagan his entire, his entire platform. To Allah. Okay? Another American right-wing neoliberal think tank. To see someone who calls himself a socialist invoking the nebulous concept of economic freedom as something that raises prosperity is unconsciousable. It's, it's 
it defies belief. I, I don't know how he just says this and like his audience doesn't call him out on it. Like even if people can't really describe this is in as much depth and I, as I am, I'm sure they still understand that it's essentially a buzzword or a dog whistle as he would call it. And then he moves on to like literally praising Naft. He was like, yeah, it has its problems, but overall it's a great idea. What the fuck? The entire point of NAFTA was to open up Mexico for free exploitation by Canada and by the USA. Because Mexico is obviously a smaller economy, much weaker economy. It's a third world country in comparison to them being first world countries and dominant imperial powers. So the point of NAFTA was essentially to open Mexico up to inflows and outflows of US and Canadian capital, US and Canadian ownership, etc, etc. And that is bad. It's bad. It's incredibly bad. It essentially opens up Mexico for free exploitation. That's what it, it did. You know, I've seen Vorsch's audience all the time invoke like the Zapatistas as a great example. Do you know why the Zapatistas exist? Because of NAFTA. They exist because they rose up in rebellion against NAFTA. Because NAFTA was part of a long process of neoliberalization in Mexico. It was like the final nail in the coffin. And they rose up because um, the, the combination of the Mexican government trying to privatize and break up ejido lands, meaning indigenous communal farming, were considered by the Zapatistas, and they have been vindicated by history, as essentially the death knell of, of communal indigenous farming in Mexico. Because first the Mexican government broke up those holdings, and then they instituted NAFTA, which allowed foreign companies to swoop in and buy up all of this now privatized formerly indigenous farmland and essentially turn it into like um, just 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 another fucking outpost of big agriculture with all of the people who used to be independent or communal farmers working in that land now forced to turn into like basically slaves for those companies who now own it. Another thing about the the institution of NAFTA aside from that is that um, as a part of entering the treaty, Mexico. I would say it was forced to, but the government of Mexico was a neoliberal government that was all for essentially selling the country off to foreign capital. But Mexico had to modify Article 27 of its constitution. There, there were fucking wars fought over the, uh, this article of the constitution. There was a, a revolution, basically, in 1917 to get this article of the constitution. And for the purposes of NAFTA, for the purposes of free trade, with the USA, this article was abrogated or heavily modified to completely change everything about it. All land in Mexico was um, the pro essentially the property, all land, water, minerals, everything was ultimately the property of the Mexican state slash Mexican people. And it, um, it required the government to expropriate land from large landholders and to redistribute it amongst um, agrarian communities, many of them which are indigenous. So that was obviously an incredibly incompatible thing to have in your constitution when you're forming a free trade agreement with the United States of America, pretty much for the express purpose of letting American companies come in and plunder the fucking hell out of your natural resources. So... The Mexican president at the time, a uh, right bastard who you should all despise, had this heavily changed and modified to um, get rid of the prohibitions on the ownership of rural land by large agricultural corporations and to get rid of the guarantees of giving land to landless rural people and communities. That was a prerequisite for the passing of NAFTA and that directly led to the Zapatista rebellion because of that, okay? Says it right here in this article. How the fuck can someone who is remotely left is support NAFTA? Or even remotely approve- I'll be like, you know, NAFTA's good and all. It just has some- you know, I know it has some problems, but it's, it's a good in spirit. No, it's fucking not. The spirit of NAFTA is neoliberalization. The plundering of Mex the Mexican economy by the much more developed imperial powers seeking to own as much of the country as they can and get as much capital out of the country as they can for themselves. That was the fucking point of it. It's essentially completely neutered Mexico's ability to protect its, its economy and its people from American corporations. That was the point of it. There's plenty of, of articles on this, for example, this one here about how um, this was essen essentially turned Mexico from like a sort of um, centristy or right-wingy like um, nationalist capitalist state, meaning that, or I guess economic nationalist is a better way to put it, meaning like it was a state that tried, you know, tried to protect the interests of its own people, at least marginally, 
into one that essentially is just directed to selling everything off to foreign companies, which has resulted in a massive rightward shift in Mexican politics. And in terms of, you know, the performance of this free trade agreement for the working class, we have another article here, which argues that um, the Mexico's neoliberal reforms, which began in the 80s and which NAFTA was pretty much the most important culmination of, have completely failed in promoting economic growth and employment at the, and that the benefits of growing exports have accrued mostly to private American firms firms. Like, I don't understand how anyone can just take these so-called free trade agreements at face value and be like, oh yeah, the spirit of it is great. The spirit of it is not what you think it is. It's not what ad it's advertised. I don't know why you take these things as just as like surface level or how anyone could. The spirit of it is American companies want to loot Mexico and this trade agreement exists to allow them to do that. When people hear this, like I've seen like the complete like 12 year old 12 year old idiots in Borsch's community tried to respond to this saying like, oh, so what, you're against trade? There's a difference between trade as in like, you know, third world countries trying to trade on terms that are as good for them as possible, which is what happens everywhere in the world already and what was already happening in Mexico before this massive neoliberalization before NAFTA. And a trade agreement that basically says you need to allow us nearly unlimited access to your country and your to, to your markets. You need to allow us to buy almost anything that we want. And you need to allow our capital to flow in and out of your country completely freely without you being guaranteed any returns from this. That's not being against trade. That's being against the exploitation of the third world by the first world. That's what these sorts of trade agreements are for. It's what they facilitate. They are a, the in, one of the institutional branches of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is a lot more than just a trade agreement. It's, it's a lot of stuff. But these agreements are one of the ways through which neoliberalism has been forcibly spread around the world. NAFTA is just one of them. If you want to get more details on it, watch my video on it. I can't go through this all here. It's, 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 neoliberalism hey. is a, like a complete ideology. I can't just go over it in a short little clip like this. So if you want more, go watch this video. But I feel like you don't really need that much more context to understand what I'm saying here. These trade agreements have been fucking disastrous. Now Praise be to a lot. One of the worst examples. So to see like Vosch, like a professed socialist, anarchist, leftist, who thinks that he dictates what leftism even means, be like, sure, NAFTA has its problems, but overall it's a good idea. No, it's fucking not. No, it's fucking not. It is absolutely fucking not. What the fuck are you saying? Communism is based. This goes less so for the EU, but still the EU is very much in the same spirit on at least on the economic side. Like these people cite like the so-called freedom of movement of the EU as essentially like some sort of gotcha. But for one, it's not actually freedom of movement because it's only for white European peoples who happen to be lucky enough to be a member or like an honorary member of the EU. Their colonies are of course excluded from this freedom of movement. Wow. But for two, you don't actually need the EU for that. You could just have a uh, massive freedom of movement agreement without this massive entire like federal European Union structure. So that's just a fucking moot point. And for free, the motivation behind this freedom of movement is wait for it, wait for it, so that the bourgeoisie can pay you less for your labor basically because there's a much bigger pool of labor. At least that's the spirit behind it. You know, they want a bigger, a larger pool of labor so that as neoliberal theory dictates, in practice it's a lot more complicated than this, they will be able to pay you less. Now, in practice, immigrants don't actually drive down overall wages. They, they drive down wages for lower skilled occupations, but this is compensated by wage increases for higher skilled occupations, so overall it averages out. Though it does sort of very marginally hurt people in... Um, in lower skilled occupations, but I don't think that is at all a reason to oppose it. But I'm just saying the motivation for doing so, like it, it's part of a package deal. It's not there by itself. The EU, in order to join the EU, you need to abide by a ton of conditions, economic criteria that essentially force you to neoliberalize your economy. You don't, you don't want to believe me? Take it from the fucking EU themselves right here. So the EU is a, another means of neoliberal, forcing neoliberalization. Now, obviously, European countries are a lot more powerful overall than a country like Mexico is in the global economy and geopolitically and in general, but it's still a means of like forcing these countries to make their economies more integrated with like the neoliberal bloc, you know, neoliberalize their economies to make them more amicable and useful for foreign capital. It's all about the interests of the bourgeoisie. 
like economic criteria for joining the EU agreed on in, in June 1993, which just happens to be at the height of the era of neoliberalization. You need a functioning market economy. You must be competitive. Basically, every single thing they're listing here, proper functioning of the goods and services market, including a good business environment, not too much state influence on product markets, and good privatization and restructuring. These are all just your generic neoliberal dog whistles. It's a fact that in order to join the EU, they need to first judge that your economy is sufficiently neoliberal. So that's a means of like, you know, you dangle the EU in front of poorer countries, and be like, oh, you want to join? You want to be one of us? You want to be a part of the white civilized European world? Well, privatize fucking everything first, buds. The EU is also, is also itself a massive barrier to any sort of state involvement in the economy. For example, on nationalizations. Don't take it from me again. Take it from the European Parliament itself, which gave an explanation on its, um, its restrictions on nationalization in 2015. So the European Commission law does not technically prohibit nationalizations. But what it does is it dictates that if a country in the EU wants to nationalize something, it can't actually just nationalize it. It can't just like appropriate it. You know, it, it needs to like force a competitive market bidding process. And as it says here, it has to act like a private market economy operator as regards to both the purchase price and the management of the nationalized undertaking. So what that means is, you can't just, like, for example, Britain, if it was still a member of the EU, couldn't just renationalize its, its railways. It would need to be like, okay, we're going to force this company to sell its assets and us, the government, we're going to have to bid for them competitively against a bunch of other private companies. And then if we win, we still have to manage, manage um, this newly nationalized railway company as if we ourselves were a competitive private enterprise, essentially rendering nationalization completely fucking moot since the whole point of doing it is to run it like at a deficit for the public good rather than for profit, rather than for the sake of competition. So that's just another huge fucking way in which the EU forces neoliberalization onto countries, forces privatization, essentially renders like anything that it considers to be undue state economic interference illegal under its very structure under its very laws like to defend the eu to be like a socialist and think that the eu is good it's just incomprehensible the eu is a block of the the world's most historically imperialist countries and that is still the most imperialist countries today outside of the us that is obviously just a means to an end for their goals for their imperialist goals even within europe itself and to ensure that none of them can stray from them ever again. As this paper, which unfortunately I can't show on stream because it's copyright, also argued along, that, along those lines, the whole idea of like the EU-European integration process was just a means of um, forcing countries to adopt neoliberal policies. This is what the EU does. It's its primary purpose. Its primary purpose is not European unity, which is a fucking... should scare you in the first place because we all know what Europe has done to the world, and still does to the world. Like, a massive fucking union of global north countries that exploit the ever-living fuck out of the third world is not a good thing. Not, e not as a concept, even putting aside all of those, even all those aspects of the forced neoliberalization, the rules that it has. It's not a good thing for the left that the EU exists, because the EU is a barrier to pretty much everything that anyone remotely on the left should support, should want. It's a massive fucking barrier to that. Anything resembling socialism is impossible under the EU by its very rules. And it just makes the Western imperialist bloc stronger and makes it far more able to oppress anything resembling socialism, anything resembling challenges to the endemic problem of unequal exchange through which the first world loots from this from the third world making all that impossible so how the fuck can someone like Vorsch, who claims to be a socialist leftist say anything resembling what he said in that clip oh yeah it also um completely fucks over it's a lot of its member states especially the smaller ones by making it impossible for them to pursue an independent monetary policy like you know they, they can't just print their own money to pay for a shit they can't choose what they do anymore they need to maintain a budget that is um, palatable to the EU because the EU is the one that issues their currency. That's what happened in Greece, got completely fucked. The EU is a bad thing. It is a terrible, shitty thing. Not as bad as NAFTA. I mean, probably is as bad as NAFTA when you consider how it enables the European colonialist countries to act as a block and oppress the third world even more. 
but for the countries within it, it's it's still very bad. Like none of this is good. None of this economic freedom or whatever leads to prosperity. Real wages haven't gone up. The point of ne of the neoliberal shifts was to constant re reconcentrate economic power, which was being lost as a result of um the sort of um social democratic more not social democratic but more social democratic post war consensus back into the hands of um of the the capital earning classes and that's what it achieved i've been, i've talked about neoliberalism so much on both of my channels and um it is honestly kind of um ridiculous that like someone who claims to be left can what say do you think about something like this like i just i have to watch it again it's so fucking dumb like economic freedom results in prosperity he sounds like a like a 12 year old globe emoji repeating what they've said like um the fucking heritage foundation say what do you think about ukraine joining the eu i think it's a great thing um the european union has its bureaucratic issue like he just thinks the issues with the Euro european union are just as too much bureaucracy not that it's a fucking harbinger of neoliberalization not that it's a block that represents the interests of the world's worst ca some of the world's worst capitalist imperialist nations are you but kidding me for the me? most part it seems to legitimately increase the economic freedom yeah he just sounds like a kid who took a uh an economics 101 class or a pol sci 101 class repeating what his fucking neoliberal professor said verbatim he doesn't even know what he's saying he doesn't understand the meaning of the words that he's saying he's just saying them because he thinks they make him sound smart in in terms that like a, a random liberal would understand as smart of people in those countries and it makes them more prosperous so you know fine. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm generally a pretty big fan of regional trade blocks, you know? It's really just a way of how they're handled. Like, NAFTA had its problems, but the concept of, like, facilitating strong economic mobility... Now, just make no mistake here. The concept of free trade, like, free, literally, agreements that mandate literally zero regulations between different countries, those can only ever possibly work if they are between countries that basically are so poor they don't actually export meaningful capital anything like putting mexico in like a free trade union with something like the us is inherently exploitative like you don't need to have a fucking so-called free trade agreement in order to trade mexico needs to do things to protect its economy from the ravages of us capital that's just a fucking fact you know and it needs to have laws that prevent um, sales to US companies, for example. It needs to have some sort of mechanism to ensure that the state actually gets something rather than foreign companies just being able to freely export capital out of the country without the Mexican state, Mexican people actually making a cent out of it. What NAFTA does is make that possible. So, no, it's not, it's not just blanket good to have a free trade agreement. Like, what the fuck? ...ability within a region is good. You know what I mean? Like, that's actually a good thing, you know? I, I would I would love to live in a North America where Mexico, Canada, and America are all just, like, regional buddies. People can travel to and... How does he think this is even possible? Like, just some fucking fantasy world where the US magically is an imperialist? From to work, no big deal, no big border crossing issues, whatever. Like, the EU has. The EU has been, I think, a generally good thing. I understand there are problems, I understand that there are some bureaucracy- It's just some nebulous problems, you know, it's not that the entire fucking thing is just a, a vehicle, of, vehicle of neoliberalization and promoting European colonial hegemony the world over. It's just that they have some little, little problems. Democratic regulations that people don't like and they don't like having an extra governmental agency above the nation state that, you know, I get that. Um, but for the most part- this is not even, nothing even resembling leftist analysis. It's just a buzzword salad. It's a fucking buzzword salad, man. Like, please read a fucking book, guys. I mean, you don't need to read a book to understand how and why this is a buzzword salad, but I honestly don't even understand how it's possible to have, like, an audience of supposed socialists and leftists who can see someone saying shit like this and not have red flags go off in their head because it's just so fucking obvious. The second someone uses a term like economic freedom, you should have fucking alarm bells going off in your head because you know exactly what they mean. Freedom for businesses. Freedom for capital to do whatever it wants. If you're a worker, your interests are directly opposed to that of capital. Your interests are directly opposed to the economic freedom of capital, which is what that word means in the first place in the way these people use it. More freedom for capital means less freedom for you, but not for Walsh, apparently. I just don't even know.